Do you know what this animal is? On the ground, it runs like a bear. In trees, it climbs like a cat. But actually, it's a binturong, and it comes from places like Burma, Vietnam, and the Philippines. The binturong is affectionate, has a tail almost as long as its body, and smells a lot like buttered popcorn. I'm Jack Hanna. Join me on Zoo Life to learn more about the animals of the world. Tiger Island at Marine World Africa USA, a combination wildlife park and oceanarium located in Vallejo, California, 30 miles north of San Francisco. Tiger Island is an amazing place. These tigers can weigh up to 500 pounds, and yet they're brought out here unchained where they spend the day with their trainers. Hey, Pat, you okay? I'm fine. We do this all the time. Interaction between animals and people is something they do all the time at Marine World Africa. The animals aren't confined to their own areas, but are taken out to explore the park, to explore other types of animals, and to explore the people. Visitors learn through the fun and excitement of close contact just how beautiful the animals of the world are. It's all a wonderful show, but there's a deeper message, respect for the animals of the world, and the need for all of us, animals and people alike, to find a way to peacefully coexist. Marine World Africa USA is one oasis of that peaceful coexistence. The Bengal tigers, like many of the animals here, are endangered in the wild due to loss of habitat. On Tiger Island, visitors get to witness the incredible bonds of trust between the tigers and their keepers as they watch them playing in their active and dramatic interaction. Boy, this island's amazing. I've never been in the same area with such big cats. Boy, Pat, what, what is the philosophy here behind playing with these cats and getting so close to them? The, our philosophy is that uh, for people to better understand them and appreciate them, and for the cat's health, uh, it's good to have a lot of human contact with the trainers and whatnot, and uh, these guys really enjoy it also. In other words, you're able, to, I guess, to answer a lot of questions from the public about these cats? Right, we, we spend a lot of time just talking to the public, explaining to them why tigers are endangered, explain to them why these animals should be protected in the wild, and it's very important to have them in parks like Marine World so they can appreciate them better. What happens when you run out of milk? I don't know. Let's see if he'll do something for it. Sam Piroc. Oh, boy. Golly day. How, how big is he? He's about probably nine and a half feet from the end of his nose, the end of his tail, and he weighs about 475 pounds. Like I said before, though, what happens when you run out of milk? I don't know. You, be you better go. I don't know. <laughs> oh, boy. Now, I noticed the, the white tiger. Um, why is it whiter? What, what's the, the rare? It, they're very rare. There's probably about 300, 350 white Bengal tigers in the world. And it's caused by basically 
Uh, his parents carried a recessive gene that caused him just to have less pigment. He's basically a blonde haired blue-eyed Bengal tiger. Would you mind, can I, can I feed him some milk? Yeah, well, let me have him do a sit-up for you, and then you can feed him some milk. Ox, sit up, sit up. OK, just go ahead and grab the carton. Wow, look at that. And just keep on feeding him. What, was Rakan born here at the, at the park? He was born at Marine World, and he's part of a litter of five cubs. His mom's had 43 cubs for us here at Marine World. God. So you raised most of the cats here? Oh, yeah. Almost all the cats that are at Marine World were actually born here. This is really an awesome feeling, Pat, to be this close to an animal this powerful and big. I've always wanted to be an animal trainer. Here was another chance. What's your name? Hello. What's your name? For me, please, please, I'll please. I want to be a parrot trainer. What? What's your name? My name is Turkey Corwin. Get Hello, out. Turkey. Gobble, gobble, gobble. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> oh, I love this bird. What kind of parrot is this? This is a double yellow-headed Amazon. Uh, mm. You must be intelligent. Uh, uh, she actually, she is very smart. Is yeah. she trying to talk to me? She's what trying to talk. Um, okay, call the kitty. Uh, kitty, 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 kitty. Meow. <laughs> it's working. I love you. <laughs> you love me? I love you. Oh, I love you too. <laughs> now, can Turkey sing a song? She can sing a song, but first she has to warm up. Turkey, warm up. Warm up. Turkey, warm up. Warm up, Turkey. La, 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 la. Get out of here. La, 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 la. <laughs> okay, are you ready? Are you ready? Okay. No. Let's. Are you ready? Let's. Turkey, please don't make me look like an Let's. idiot, okay? Not on test for TV. Please, Turkey. Are you ready? Let's. Open like a bird and Tweet. 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 Turkey, are you singing to me? <laughs> <laughs> what, what is the trick to teaching? What's it? Te <laughs> okay, thank you, Turkey. Thank you too. Yeah. What's the trick to keeping him? Uh, what's the trick to keeping him quiet? Much less talking. That's a trick with her. She never shuts up. But how do you do it? Is it reward? So, yes. Um, once a bird says something that you want them to say, you reward them. With her, we give her sunflower seeds. And that encourages them to say it again, because they expect a reward uh, for it. If you had this parrot at home, it'd keep you up all night. That's why we have her, yeah. She was donated to us, and I think she drove the, her owners crazy. Drove them crazy? Right. I had one that sounded like a vacuum. It was amazing. Never would shut up. We have one that sounds like a smoke alarm. Uh -huh. Really? That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. OK. See you later. Goodbye. Bye. Yeah, bye. Bye. Okay, bye. Bye. Oh, oh. <laughs> You're a goof. Give me a kiss. Oh. Are you a good girl? Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Zoos and wildlife park habitats are getting better all the time. Better for the viewing public, but more importantly, better for the animals that live in them. Elephants are social animals, but in the old zoos, they were sometimes kept in isolation. Tina, a female Asian elephant, lived for 20 years in a small concrete cell in a New York zoo. Her only friend was her old trainer, and when he died, Tina became belligerent, and none of the other trainers would go near her. She was considered to be dangerous, and when the zoo closed, all the other animals found new homes, but no one wanted Tina. But then, Marine World Africa offered to take her. There, change was rapid and dramatic. Maybe all she needed was special care, other elephants, and a more natural environment. You know, Dave, she doesn't look too dangerously hostile to me. Nah, she's a good girl. It had to have been hard for her being alone for so many years. Yeah, I think it was tough. It, it really makes a difference when they have other elephants to interact with, play with. I noticed during all those first years she was on, on concrete. What was it like for her to get on grass and actually eat grass and everything? I don't think she'd ever seen grass before. We were walking her and, and Judy out in the, on the back 40, and um, Judy was eating the grass as we went along, and Tina was just sort of smelling it, didn't know what it was. So I grabbed a big handful of it and stuffed it in her mouth, and then she like, oh, that's something I can eat. She started shoveling in her mouth because she'd always been on cobblestone or concrete. I understand she likes some food out here other than grass. Oh, yeah, one of her favorites uh, is California French bread. French bread? Oh, man. Wow. As you can just, see. You just put the whole thing in there? Yep. But you better get another one, because uh, one's not enough. Holy mac! We're just shoving that one in there, too? Yep. Won't choke her? No, no, no. It has to be San Francisco sourdough, though. Like How many can she eat at one time? Oh, she probably eats about a dozen a day, but she'd probably eat 40 or 50 without any trouble. I'd have to burp after that many. If being social is the key to keeping the elephants healthy and happy, Tina's found the perfect home in Marine World Africa. 
of San Diego is noted for their spectacular killer whale shows, as well as their costume characters like Shamu here. But they also do a great deal of work in conservation, education, and research. Right, Shamu? We had a special opportunity to go behind the scenes at the penguin encounter with Yopi Kuhn, supervisor of birds. Now, what kind of a baby penguin is this? Well, Jack, this is a six-week-old baby Humboldt penguin. They're found off the southern coast of South America by Chile and Peru. We happen to have a colony here at SeaWorld. A captive breeding program may help the endangered Humboldt penguin to survive by hand-rearing chicks taken from the nest that might not have lived in the wild. The successful hand-rearing of penguins can be traced to a devoted and caring round-the-clock staff who serve as surrogate parents. The baby penguins are fed five times a day, and their diet includes vitamins, fish, and the infamous penguin milkshake. This, believe it or not, is gonna be a penguin, a baby penguin dinner. That's right, that's right. It's gonna be the baby penguin milkshake we're gonna make, Jack. Milkshake? That's right. Oof. Get it. <laughs> that's right. How do, you, how do you do this? Okay, take the top off that. Oh, I get to do it? You get to do it. That's right, take the lid off. All right. All right, the cream is already in there. What you need to do is add all this krill, which is a small shrimp-like crustacean. We're gonna take herring, cut it into fillets. We're gonna do half and half cream, some water, all sorts of vitamins and minerals. We're gonna put it in a blender and we're gonna whip it up like a milkshake. Oh, just touching this stuff makes me... You can see it looks just like tiny little shrimp. Oh, I don't believe we're putting this in milk. <laughs> and you put it on low, so start blending. Oh, no. Don't stick your face close to it after you drop it in. Just like that. Oh, yo. <laughs> I, I, I can't, I can get into this. Go ahead and pull it right off the top of the blender, pull the, and then we get to look inside. Make sure it's the right consistency, I'm just the so way you like it. I am looking excited to see this. Yopi, that looks that just looks like a chocolate milkshake. That doesn't it? Now you know why we call it the penguin milkshake. The milkshake is heated and fed to the penguins through a syringe. Take your hand oh, that's all the milkshake he gets? That's all he gets. He just gets a little bit, and you get to give him two of these. When that mouth opens up, you put it right in. They don't have any teeth to chew it up or anything. They swallow it whole just like that. That is amazing. Yep. Now, I know that this little guy doesn't live down in Antarctica. Can you show me some birds that do? Yeah. <laughs> Yopi, I've been in Antarctica, but I've never, you know, I, I've never been this close to this, this many penguins. It's great in here, isn't it? A little cold, but it's great in hey, here. Yeah, how cold is it? It's about 25 degrees Fahrenheit in here, so a little bit below freezing. This looks just like Antarctica. Yeah, that's the whole idea. This exhibit was designed to simulate everything you would see in the Antarctic. So you actually follow the whole entire cycle of just how it is in the wild with these penguins. Exactly. That's a whole... Hey, hey. <laughs> hey. Okay, I know. Hey, I know it's too cold, okay? Let me finish. <laughs> Now, everybody thinks that all the penguins, 17 species, I guess, right. are in cold weather. Right, but that's not always true. There's only two penguins that they consider what they call true Antarctic, which means they never leave the Antarctic. That's a little Adelie penguin. They're all black and all white and only weigh about eight pounds. And that's the emperor penguin, and they stand about four feet tall and weigh almost 100 pounds. Now, these penguins, because I'm cold, I mean, how do they stay so warm? OK, that's a, that's a real neat thing about penguins, is they are designed for a cold climate. It's actually three layers that work together as one. First, there's the feathers. Very short, tiny, overlapping feathers, like shingles on a roof. There are 70 feathers per square inch. And if this is a square inch, just like that, and you hold it up to one of these birds, yeah. there's 70 feathers in that little circle. And look how big this bird is. There's thousands. You got tens of thousands of feathers. Exactly. Then they have a thick layer of skin, and actually a thick layer of fat. So between the fat, the skin, and the feathers that are on the outside, that's how the penguins stay warm in a sub-freezing temperature. No, hey, that's not nice. Oh, well, there's a pecking order here. There's a pecking order in all the like different species anymore. and all the birds. You should have done that. And he doesn't want to share any of his oh, attention with anyone. Now, what's this bird over here? What's wrong with this bird? He's molting. 
And what that means is they're losing feathers and growing new feathers in. And it's a yearly process they go to to rejuvenate their feathers that they have. Okay, Yopi, I think I'm going to get out of here. It's a little cold right now. Yeah, it's cold in there. Wow. All right, Jack. All right. See you later. All right, we'll see you later. All right. I'm going to walk like a penguin. Ah! Walk like a penguin. Come on, Bart. Come on. Come on. Let's all sit down and paint. It's tongue painting instead of finger painting. <laughs> At Lowry Park Zoo in Tampa, Florida, a special program for orangutans becomes fun for humans as well. Dave, how intelligent do you think these animals really are? Well, just from working with them, they're, they're extremely intelligent. Uh, they don't do well on IQ tests because they pretty much do what they want to do. They're not nearly as demonstrative as a chimpanzee or even a gorilla, but they have a great deal of innate intelligence. Are any of these paintings? That's, that's Josie. What? <laughs> what a big kiss. <laughs> Hi, Josie. Do uh, you want to buy my painting? I, it only sell, I'll sell it to you for about a dollar. <laughs> Josie, no, hey, hey! Come on, I've been working on that thing. Come here. Come back here. Let me have my painting. Come. What are you doing? Uh, you are so funny. I don't have fleas. No, I don't. I don't have fleas. These guys seem like they're more interested in playing this morning than painting. <laughs> they're one of painting. Hey! <laughs> What? How am I supposed to sell? <laughs> it's an art critic. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. That's a girl. That's a girl. Bring her shoe back. You got her shoe. She got your shoe. I like face painting. This is what we do at the zoo. We do face painting. Look here. Let me do my face. Look here. See? A little on my nose. I'm putting a little on your nose. Now, do people buy these things? Yes, they do. <laughs> right. We sell these in the gift shop. Uh, we might get extra money for this one if we can put your name on it. Yeah. Me. <laughs> I thought teaching my three girls to finger paint was fun. This has been an absolute blast. Plus, I can end up selling these for a dollar or two. Thanks a lot, Josie. Here you go. <laughs> Each creature in the animal world has something unique to offer. For those animals that we have brought into our human world, that uniqueness is even more apparent. As we get to know them, we notice their distinctive personalities, the special qualities that make them special friends. Some friends are liked just because they're a little odd. Youth volunteer Meredith Lindley is fond of all the animals, but her favorite? That's a two-headed turtle. What kind of turtle is this? This is a red belly. Turtle. He's got two heads. It's a Siamese twin. That's rare. Well, if humans can have Siamese twins, can't turtles? I guess they can, but I mean, which turtle's running, which, which head's running the turtle? Well, there are two spinal cords, so like the right head runs the right side of the body and the left head runs the left side of the body. But they each got a brain. Yeah, they've got a spinal cord, so. That means this could be the smartest turtle in the world. Two brains? True. Can you imagine? Two guys are better than one. Oh, oh, that is so funny. When Homo Sassa Springs was established as a state wildlife park, it was designed to be a refuge for many of Florida's native animals, such as the American alligator, the great blue heron, and the endangered manatee. Surprisingly, its most popular resident is a native African. Come on, Lou. Come on, Lou. Wow-wee. <laughs> this is Lucifer, a Nile hippopotamus. And he's one of the last remaining exotic species here at Homosassa Springs. The people all got together to really save him a place to live right here at one of the prettiest parks in Florida. Now, Lucifer, come here a minute. I want to give you some watermelon. Golly day, JP. How Holy mac! He could eat a whole watermelon. Before we go, he's giving that whole watermelon for a snack. That last one there. Wildlife supervisor J.P. Garner has been friends with Lou for 20 years and knows exactly what he likes. <laughs> Look at that mouth. Come here, Lou. He loves you, Jackie. Look, you can't go home. He'd follow you home if you get him in your car. <laughs> How much does he weigh? He weighs close to 6,000 pounds. He gain another 2,000, they get 8,000. Good night. A big pig. 
Right You're right, it's called a water pig. That's him. Don't bite my fingers now. <laughs> Let go of my fingers. Look, look. But now, hippos don't eat he? people. No, he's not a meat eater. You imagine how many squirrels would take to feed him if he was a carnivore? <laughs> <laughs> No, they're they're threatened. They'll turn it over. They won't really eat the people, but they're they're a dangerous animal. Yeah. Now, there's quite a story about Lucifer that the governor got involved in saving him for the park. Absolutely, sure did. What happened? The park philosophy is not to have exotic animals because we're a Florida State Park, so it meant Lucifer had to go. And the people in town who've grown up with this animal said, "Oh no, no way." So, Citrus County Chronicle did a campaign to stop uh, Lucifer from going. After the governor starts getting all these letters about a hippo, he didn't know what they were talking about, but a 3,000 letters dumped on his desk. He's going, oh, you know, something's happening here. So he wrote a letter down here giving Lucifer a reprieve to live the rest of his life right here. So how many more years do you think old Lucifer's got here? I'd say he's got 20, 25 more years. He's just a youngster, man, just out of high school. You know, he's, he's getting out of where he's graduating now. He's got a lot of years left. I tell you, the governor made a commitment, didn't he? He really did. He got another 2,000 pounds and another 25 years to go. <laughs> Come on, Lou. Does he spend most of his time in the water? Or? He spends most of his time in the water. And you see, it's very, it's very comfortable for him because of gravity. All that weight is off of him, and he's almost just like floating. Now, he's practicing yoga, hippo yoga. <laughs> Come on back out here with me. Look, we've got some friends here. Come on up. So what if the hippopotamus has killed more people than any other animal in Africa? To JP, this one's just a big baby who's scared of storms. Well, Lucifer knows me very well because I've been with him since 1975, and, and we've been through a lot of hard times together, some good times and bad times like the hurricanes. And so I stay down here with him when we have hurricanes and just, I just pet his mouth, just scratch the inside of his mouth and his tongue, and he, it takes the fear away. If I'm down here with him, he, he loses the fear. You got such a pretty face, Lucifer. Okay, that enough, huh? That enough? You like Jack, don't you? Yeah, one little kiss. kiss. One little kiss. One little kiss. <laughs> <laughs> He's smelling your breath. Yeah, he didn't like it, huh? <laughs> As beloved as Lou is, Jake the Crocodile is another story. Some animals are just so mean and ornery, they carve out a special spot in your heart. Is that a salt, what's that, saltwater? No, he's an he's American acutus crocodile, it's acutus American crocodile. Those things are rare, aren't they? Very rare, probably got maybe 30 pairs left in the wild, breeding pairs, that's it. Now, how, in the Everglades. How big is he? He's about between 13, 14 feet, a nice size animal. Now, the reason you keep him in here is that I understand he likes to eat alligators. He is so vicious, he's so mean that he doesn't even like his own self. He, that's, and that's he's, bad. That's yeah, bad. He bites himself about every 45 minutes just to prove he's mean. But he killed quite a few alligators in there, including a famous gator we had there named Blinky. And you call him what? Jake. Mean Jake. Jake? Jake? Mean Jake. Hey, Jake, come here. How do you get him over here? Well, I don't know. You see him in the sun, you, yeah. you don't really do anything with him he doesn't want to do. We may have to just kind of walk along that fence line and drop him some meat over there. He was hungry. He was hungry yesterday. Now, you keep him uh, away. I will. See, Jake's more interested in us than he is eating right now. Hey, Jake. Yeah, uh, we approach his territory. He can't bust through this chain link, can he? Uh, no. <laughs> I like it's that answer. close. Uh, no. Hey, Jake, come here. Just hold this thing over. Pitch it over there and let it land right on his snout. Hey, Jake. Jake, look here. Jake. <laughs> so see why we had to separate him? Bad news, Daddy. Let's push this piece over yeah, there. Push that piece over there. Jake, come on. He's not used to this. Uh, Jake, look here. Now, eat it, Jake. <laughs> <laughs> See, he's pretty fierce. Holy mackerel! I think I can reach it from here. Let me see. We we'll get a little deep. Yeah. <laughs> oh, 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 oh! What would ha I mean? What would he do? Drown you or bite you in two? Huh? I know he'd kill you. I know he'd kill you. Snap you down, you? down on you. Start rolling and tear you in pieces. Oh. Tear your arms off, your head, your legs. 
tear Ooh. you to fucking pieces. Just rip them right off. He'd tear them off your butt. He'd swallow your hole? Swallow your hole. He'd be on you before you could, you'd never turn. And he what? How, oh, 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 gosh, it's just frightening. Oh. Some animals are special because they help humans. This olive baboon named Rosie is a teacher's aide to students at Moore Park College in California. Boy, you're beautiful. You are intelligent, too. Uh, are you cleaning your grape off? Let me do that. Take care. The exotic animal training and management program focuses on zookeeping, animal training, and wildlife education. Rosie's colleague is instructor Gary Wilson. Now, how old is Rosie? Rosie is 12 years old. She was born at, the, at UC Davis and then uh, came to our facility when she was four months old, and we've had her ever since. Boy, it's really it's, it's something to see a baboon that you're able to to work with this close. The students spend a lot of time building up a good relationship with her. So they're really uh, not only trainers, but they're buddies. Now, what does it mean when she's going like this? That's a greeting that they do. Yeah, the lip smacking is a, is a greeting that baboons do to each other. And uh, we do it to her and she does it to us as well. Oh, now she's turning her mm -hmm. back into me. What's that mean? That means she likes you. Oh. <laughs> oh, well, I, you know, I knew there was something there going between us. <laughs> In the wild, there's always something going on between baboons. Elaborate greetings and dramatic signs of attraction. Their complicated social life would do justice to any soap opera. Family relations are marked by constant togetherness, as well as much intelligent and tender loving care. Grooming is perhaps the most important activity. The expression, I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine, just might have started here. Now, is she grooming you right now? Uh-huh. Yeah, she's grooming me. The, the grooming, of course, is important for uh, keeping animals free of parasites, but it's actually more important in establishing social bonds, maintaining relationships between the animals. It's a way that they can get close to each other. You got bugs or something? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I let her groom me all the time, so she keeps me pretty clean. This out. Now, does that feel funny when she's picking your hairs? No, she's pretty gentle when she does it. She's pretty thorough. Yeah, she doesn't miss much. <laughs> I think she's found a bug. <laughs> At Marine World Africa USA in California, raising primates not only means you have a special friend, you just might have a new member of the family. One of my favorite animals is a chimpanzee. That's because they're so bright. With me is Liam Hussey, who's a head chimp trainer and curator here at the, uh, at the park. Now, who is this, this little is guy? This is Maggie. She's a two-and-a-half-year-old female chimp. Wow. So you raise these at home? or We've raised park? five baby chimps at the park so far in the last 10, 11 years, my wife and I. Your wife and you? Yeah. Well, I guess it's better than kids. Well, I don't know. They're a lot stronger than kids are. Seven-year-old Teeley is a little old for such shenanigans, but Maggie doesn't leave her much choice in the matter. Sit. Teeley, sit. Easy. <laughs> Ma Maggie, get up. Good girl. <laughs> you like, remind me of Albert. I used to have one named Albert. Good oh, girl. Yeah, one thing she doesn't like is if you try to pick her up. Right. She, she likes people on her terms basically. But if you're willing to go along with her terms, you just might be in for a special treat. Oh, whoa, <laughs> good, Maggie. Good girl. That's good. Good girl. <laughs> good girl, Maggie. Maggie, you're <laughs> fun, aren't you? So your life for these chimps, I mean... Yeah, for the last 12 years it has been. Yeah, we're very... Um, I don't know, we're we're, we love what we do, we really enjoy it. We, you basically become part of the social group with the animals, you become a provider, you feed them, you take care of them, you medicate them. I mean, they're just like humans, really. I mean, the Yeah, same they get sick happen. every winter, they get a cold, we get a cold from them, they get a cold from us. They get inoculated just like a human child would. But unlike humans, Liam's primate family remains childlike their whole lives. Chimpanzees live 50 to 60 years in captivity, but they're always dependent on you for food, for clothing. I mean, funny, funny as it sounds, in the winter time when it's cold, sometimes they do have to wear a shirt or a sweatshirt. They rely on you for their for their for cleaning their for cleaning their areas, for getting them out, for exercising, for stimulating them both, both mentally and physically. 
that's one of the things with, with animals, you know, if you t put them in a captive situation, you have to adapt. You have to let, you know, you have to get them out and do things for them. You have to stimulate them because no matter how hard you try, you'll never be able to copy or mimic what they'd have in the wild because you just don't have the space to do it. Here, there's a laugh. There's a laugh. There's a funny noise. Come on, laugh. Laugh. Good girl. And what do they weigh when they're born? Two to three pounds, like a preemie baby. Yeah, what does she weigh, about 30 pounds? A little over 30 pounds, Whew. 35. If it's impossible to resist the playful Maggie, it's even more impossible to ignore the close relationship we share with her and all the great apes. That alone makes us very special friends. Ah! <laughs> That's funny. That's funny, Maggie. That's funny. Tail feet. There we go. Look at those little feet go. Well done, Petey. With their impressive performances, the trained parrots at Bush Gardens in Tampa, Florida are certainly special. Not only are they ambassadors for their species, but they're also the very good friends of Tony Grimaldi, who trains them by adapting their wild behaviors. is a blue and gold macaw. He isn't yet a public speaker, but he's working on it. So let's hear what he has to say. Hello, Fred. Hello, Fred. Why, thank you. <laughs> this time, though, how about saying hello to everyone? Ah. You might think that uh, speaking uh, words is a little bit foreign to a macaw in the wild, and that may be true, but macaws need to learn how to speak from their parents. They're not just hatched knowing what to say. Because of that, they're very good learners, and Fred is an exceptional bird that loves to communicate. Why don't you pick out one of your many favorite songs and sing it for us? Are you ready? Sing. Ooh, good selection. By the way, if you do recognize the tune, feel free to join in. Parrots are such social creatures. They thrive on interaction with any creature, whether it's human or bird. Pretty good, pretty good. Listen, all of you better remember that the more you cheer, the faster your bird will race. Okay, you guys ready? On your marks. Get set. And go! And they're off. Come on, ladies and gentlemen, get those hands together. Napoleon ring number one, sunshine ring number one, beak and beak race. Keep the hands going. Into the final stretch, there goes sunshine. Here comes Napoleon. Who will it be? Sunshine is the winner. You know, Tony, those were amazing behavior. Just how smart are these birds? Very intelligent. Not only can they perceive colors and differentiate between what the colors mean, but I've heard of uh, macaws in the wild being able to smell and see the ripeness of a fruit. He is a very intelligent bird, and not only that, he's also a very loving bird. This right here wow. is a very good example of trust on both his part and my part. He could take your finger off. He certainly could take it right off. But not only that, if he were to let go of my finger or I were to drop him, he would be very injured. And another posture is this is the same way. Very easy for me to let go and let him slide to the floor. And birds' bones are made for flying, not for hitting the floor. <laughs> so he would be very injured. These tricks that we're seeing, mm -hmm. does that reinforce their natural behavior? It certainly does. This posture right here is one that they would use in the nest. It would be a posture of submission. Should uh, one of the other nest mates, um, should there be a fight that might be brewing up, it would be a way of, of consoling that. It would also be a way of soliciting um, attention from the parents. Um, also, hanging down like this is a very good way to go from branch to branch collecting your food. You can not only use your, your feet, which he has two of right here to grab, grip things, you can use your beak, huh. which gives you a lot more maneuverability. Now, what else does Petey do? Okay, Petey. Very good, Petey. Now, you might th not think, Jack, that uh, roller skating is a very natural behavior. And in the wild, indeed, you probably would never see a macaw on roller skates. No. But you see how he's perching there? and also how he's moving on something that's moving. That is very much something that they would do in the wild. Tr moving through the trees is not a very steady routine. And you have to be able to grip the branches that are being blown, and also it's usually on the end of the very thin branches where you find the fruits. Oh no, I can't even roller skate. Exactly, well it shows, uh, it shows how he can keep his balance and how easy it is for him to learn 
to keep his balance on something that's moving like this. And I know you give him a, re a little reward after every... Yes, I do. What they are are peanuts, and they're not part of his normal diet. Oh, giving a peanut to a macaw is a lot akin to giving a candy to a baby. I see. It's something he thoroughly enjoys, and uh, he will do even more th than his average day yeah. for something he really enjoys. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> yes, I can see that. Would you like Petey to give you a kiss? Oh, yeah. We'll try that real quick. No, they are such a social animal. You won't take that, off my uh, head, will it? Not at all. Petey has learned to love this. Oh, I tickle. <laughs> yeah, that little tongue comes right out, and he is literally tasting you. There we go. Oh, that's good, Pete. That's good. That's good. No, oh, that's nice to kiss Jack. There we go. <laughs> I think, I think that most people have a love for animals, and those people that work in zoos have taken that love one step further. They've made caring for animals their full-time job. When I was 11 years old, I used to hitchhike 20 miles a day just to work for veterinarian. And can you believe I work for free? The love that a zookeeper gives an animal is like the love we might give our families. It's very important that every single day the zookeeper knows what these animals eat and how they're acting. So the veterinarians know how to care for them. Yeah, you're a good boy. Squeak, squeak. If it wasn't for the zookeeper, many, many animals would not have a future. Right? Right? Right. Ah! We'll see you next time.